there. I'm Sheila Wildkin, Associate Director of the Health Law Institute, um, welcoming you to the sixth lecture in this year's Health Law and Policy Seminar Series. Uh, Mary Ellen Trapel Vond, who was originally scheduled for this date, was unfortunately unable to make it, but happily, Dave Snow uh, was available to share his important work with us. Uh, so Dave Snow was born and raised in Fredericton, uh, New Brunswick, where he completed a BA in Political Science uh, at St. Thomas University. Uh, then he completed an MA and PhD in political science at the University of Calgary, specializing in assisted reproductive technology policy and constitutional law. He's currently a Killam postdoctoral fellow at Noble Tech Ethics uh, in the Faculty of Medicine here at Dalhousie. And beginning in July, he'll join the Department of Political Science at the University of Guelph. So beyond Dave's work in the area of assisted reproduction law and policy, his research has addressed social policy issues including homelessness and the regulation of liquor sales, as well as central features of Canadian constitutional democracy, like the little used Section 33 override. So without any further ado, uh, speaking of overrides, time for Dave to override me. <laughs> um, can everyone hear me okay without the mic? Yeah, okay, I tend to not use mics. Um, thank you, Sheila, for that lovely introduction, and thanks to all of you for coming here. I'm really excited to have an opportunity to share with you some of my research that I've been working on for too many years to count, uh, and, and, and get some feedback from a legal audience uh, on the legal aspect of my research. So the title of my talk is Assisted Reproductive Technology Policy, Can We Get Past the Roadblocks? And what I'm gonna be looking at is what I've called Canada's ART policy puzzle. I'm going to mention right now that for me it's second nature to see ART and think assisted reproductive technologies. I realize for many people I'm not talking about art policy and you're going to see that acronym a lot. And I call it a puzzle because what happened is after 10 years in the making Canada passed extremely comprehensive assisted reproductive technology legislation in 2004 and six years later, it was struck down by the Supreme Court of Canada. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell a lot of that story for violating provincial jurisdiction over health. And four plus years later, every province except Quebec has done virtually nothing in terms of policy making in this field. So it's a puzzle because it's very evidently what I've termed a policy failure. And that doesn't mean that it's bad policy, although many, in fact most, think it is, but that Federal policymakers and federal politicians tried to do something, and what we've ended up with is something very different. So beyond the obvious answer of, to the question of why do we end up with this policy, the obvious answer is, well, because the Supreme Court struck down the law for violating these provisions in the Constitution, I go back and I look at a number of primary documents in the, in the history, in the lead up to the passage of this policy to understand why this policy failure occurred and what it means for um, uh, for future policy making both in this field and in others. And my answer has to do with this growing field in public policy and political science and even in legal analysis called policy framing, which I'll talk more about, and particularly this concept I've developed called jurisdictional framing, which is about how governments frame a particular policy as properly belonging to one level of government rather than another in a federation. And so having explained all that and having given some history explanation of why this policy uh, failure has occurred, I, I then I'm going to talk a little bit and invite questions on this question of what can be done. And so the title of my talk, Can We Get Past the Roadblocks, the vast majority is going to be explaining what the current roadblocks are and why they exist, and then I'll open it to you and I'll give some preliminary suggestions as to uh, why or what, what can be done to get past the roadblocks, and just as a spoiler, um, pretty pessimistic uh, that anything can be done <laughs> to get past the roadblocks. So what is assisted reproductive technology policy? The literature, regardless of the field, is heavily divided on what's meant by this policy field. The definition I offer is a broad one. So it's the rules, which is to say rules that come down from government or from organizations that are delegated authority by government, such as self-regulating medical organizations, for the use of human reproductive material. So this is primarily human eggs, human sperm, and human embryos, uh, for two purposes. First being non-coital or non-sexual reproduction, uh, so when we think of what goes on in fertility clinics, when we think of surrogacy, when we think of all the rules related to licensing and storage of human reproductive material, um, th those rules fit within assisted reproductive technology policy. 
but also beyond that, the use of human reproductive material for scientific research. So here we get into rules for um, genetic manipulation, for pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, which is uh, embryonic diagnosis, fetal diagnosis, prenatal diagnosis, and even all the way to human cloning and embryonic stem cell research. So this is an extremely broad field, and this is a broad definition. Uh, some exclude that second category from it, uh, but it certainly um, is the definition that Canadian policymakers use throughout the entire process. And a couple of important things to note about this field. First of all, it's relatively new. The first child born through in vitro fertilization, which is fertilization outside of, the, of a woman's uterus and, and in the lab, which is then transferred into a woman's uterus, was Louise Brown. She was born in 1978. So the first child, that's, that's frequently the point that's identified as sort of the beginning moment when governments around the world said, huh, maybe we've got to do some regulation in this area. It's less than 40 years ago, which makes it easy for um, scholars to identify when policy began in a given jurisdiction. And the other thing is that it has enormous political implications, as we would expect from a broad field. If people are involved, uh, institutions, advocacy groups, um, arms of government that have anything to do with just some of these uh, um, areas that I've mentioned here, then assisted reproductive technology is going to affect those areas. So it's a, it's a policy field that, is, that has attracted scholars from a lot of different disciplines and attracted a lot of interdisciplinary work. A brief word on what I mean by policy framing, because this is the theoretical framework I use to explain. Uh, policy framing is a concept that's growing in the, especially political science and public policy literature, but I would also argue in the legal literature, even though the term isn't always used. A lot of legal analysis looks at the way politicians, interest groups, um, sort of political elites, if you will, frame the way a given policy area, um, or frame, frame a policy area to the public. So it's about structuring political debate, creating a simplified image of otherwise complex policy options. I'll use a controversial example of abortion. Right? Abortion policy, we're familiar with groups or political elites who will frame it and say this, this policy area is fundamentally about a woman's right to choose. Or other groups, this policy area is fundamentally about the rights of the unborn. Right? Another, maybe less controversial, maybe equally controversial policy field, think of the oil sands in Alberta and think of what different political parties, how they frame that debate. The federal government and indeed Alberta's current progressive conservative government frame the oil sands as fundamentally being about growing Canadian economy or making Canada an energy superpower. Whereas the federal NDP is far more likely to frame that policy when they're talking about it as being about environmental degradation uh, and contributing to climate change. So it's about taking an issue and simplifying the image to make it more saleable to the public or indeed more saleable to other um, politicians. And it's especially important in a new field. Because if a new policy field develops, if new technologies develop, such as occurred with assisted reproductive technologies, uh, and there's sort of a, an information vacuum in the public and even among elites, then the definition of the situation at the outset that prevails is going to be extremely important in affecting future public policy. One of the problems I've identified with the policy framing literature, there's my Marco Rubio moment for anyone who remembers that, uh, is that I study federations and I study federalism. And the policy framing literature has been all about substance. But in my years of studying Canadian law, I recognize that politicians and interest groups and, and, and um, parliamentarians and, and, and bureaucrats even will frame issues as not just being about a particular substance, but also as be properly belonging to one government rather than the other. Um, and there's been little in the literature about this way that we frame in terms of jurisdictional competence. So I developed this. Um, sort of dichotomy between substantive framing, which is policy framing as traditionally known on the one hand, and then what I call jurisdictional framing. So jurisdictional framing, as I define it, is describing a policy as properly belonging to one level of government rather than the other. And it contains two components that are related, uh, but that are, are different and have different implications for the policy making process. And the first we could think of any policy area is the normative question, the ought question. Why should a government act? So we'll frequently see the federal government say, uh, this is an issue of concern to all Canadians and we must act. Uh, think, of, uh, think of, for example, the way that the liberal government has, or liberal governments in the past federally have framed the need for a national daycare policy, right? That's an ought question. The federal government ought to act. We need uniformity across the country. The second is the more procedural element, be probably of more interest to a legal audience, which is explaining why it is that the government has the legal capacity to act. And this is not something that's pitched at the public so much as it is at fellow lawmakers. 
Uh, so they're interrelated, they're easily conflated, but they are different. So a diagram to help simplify all this. This is traditional policy framing, what I call substantive framing. This policy is fundamentally about X. Oil sands are fundamentally about growing the Canadian economy. Right? The two aspects to jurisdictional framing, the normative, the federal government must act, and then the procedural, we have the authority under Section 9127 of the Constitution Act 1867. Far less sexy kind of policy frame, um, but one that nevertheless <laughs> remains important. That collectively is jurisdictional framing. So, on to the Canadian story. I've sort of explained my theoretical framework. Just about everyone, and with good reason, who studies system reproductive technology policy in Canada identifies the, the start of the policymaking process with the Royal Commission on New Reproductive Technologies. Now, the Royal Commission was struck by Prime Minister Brian Mulroney in 1989, and he commissioned a group of experts to study, uh, and he gave them a mandate for examining the social, ethical, health, legal, and economic implications of what were then known as new reproductive technologies. Sweeping mandate. It took them four years to report, 283 recommendations, over a thousand page document, millions of dollars spent on consultations with interest groups and Canadians across the board. Uh, and those 283 recommendations I will sum up as fall, calling, falling into three categories. First, that the federal government ought to create a number of criminal prohibitions. Right? There were certain activities and behaviors that were so beyond the pale that they ought to be criminally prescribed uh, with the threat of jail time or severe fines. Second, a regulatory structure. So these are the more beneficial aspects of assisted reproductive technologies, which the Commission still felt required government oversight. Uh, the Commission was by no means sort of um, pro-market, let the market decide, let the medical organizations do what they want. The Commission's argument was that there needed government oversight, even for those beneficial aspects of assisted reproductive technologies. And then third, that there be a national agency. That this all needed to be done by the federal government at the national level. Very few of its 283 recommendations applied to provincial governments or medical organizations. Right? So it was very much framed as a national issue. Now the most important study of the Royal Commission on Reproductive Technologies in my mind, and I'm including my own studies here, is Francesca Scala's work, um, especially in 2002, but subsequent work on the Royal Commission. She's a political scientist at, uh, at Concordia University. And she used a policy framing approach as well to explain why it is the Royal Commission came to its recommendations. What were the influences on the Commission's final recommendation? And she identifies two frames that were prominent in the late 80s and early 90s surrounding what were then known as new reproductive technologies because they were new. And the first, and this is common to a lot of literature on sort of moral issues, is what she calls the medical scientific frame, which saw reproductive technologies as being neutral and necess necessary, as transforming the patient into a client, this is privileging the idea of scientific progress, and as sociologist Peter Conrad defines, when assisted reproductive technologies are defined in medical terms, they are to be treated with medical intervention. And you'll not be surprised to know that it was medical organizations and scientific research organizations that most pushed this medical scientific view of what assisted reproductive technologies were. Interestingly, Scala also found that the vast majority of legal organizations largely subscribed to uh, the medical scientific view. Not all, but the vast majority. She also identifies another frame, a more amorphous frame, and she doesn't give it a name, but I call it the moral frame. And so part of the reason that she doesn't name it and part of the reason it's so difficult to define is it encompasses different groups that don't often agree on a lot of policy fields. So you had a lot of feminist organizations on the one hand and a lot of social and religious conservative organizations as well agreeing that these technologies were harmful to society for a number of different reasons. Uh, but what they had in common was a broader critique of science and medicine, and they would frequently make uh, use of the language of commodification, so treating women and children as commodities to be bought and sold, of exploitation of vulnerable women, and of the commercialization of women's reproduction, of reproduction more generally, but of reproduction uh, women primarily as being harmful. Also language of affronts to human dignity, and those sorts of things. Uh, and what Scala and others found, and it's certainly the dominant conception in the literature, is that the Royal Commission was far more influenced by the medical scientific frame. And that its recommendations and its language reflect the, the medical scientific frame. Uh, so this stuff didn't win the day, according to the dominant conception of the Royal Commission on New Reproductive Technologies. So using this table, again, 
This is not to say that Scala left out jurisdictional framing because it's a term that I've invented in the last couple of years. But in terms of policy framing, she said it was primarily medical scientific. And there's a number of reasons that I'm not going to go into about just the organizational structure of the commission itself. Happy to talk about those in Q&A. I say this is largely true, but there is one important qualification uh, which renders itself increasingly important as we look at the trajectory of policy beyond the Royal Commission, and that has to do with those criminal prohibitions that I mentioned. The Royal Commission said that there were certain practices that conflict so sharply with the values of Canadians that they must be prohibited, and these included just about any and all commercial activities involving human reproductive material, so they recommended a prohibition on payment for human sperm, eggs, embryos, and surrogacy, for certain forms of embryonic research, certain forms of genetic research and genetic manipulation, and of course, human cloning. Not just the content of those um, recommendations is what's important though, because the framing is also crucial. And when we look at the language that the Commission used to frame the criminal prohibitions, it's very much in keeping with the moral frame, right? Dehumanizing effects, criticism of the market, commercial exchanges undermining dignity and leading to commodification of women and children. Uh, not only is this in keeping with the moral way of framing these technologies, but it also certainly doesn't correspond to the medical scientific frame. This sort of language and these sorts of prohibitions don't privilege technological values or unlimited notions of positivist progress. They're neither neutral nor client-centered. And they were opposed by and continue to be opposed by the medical profession in Canada then and now. So rather than saying that the Royal Commission was uniformly medical scientific in terms of its framing and its recommendations, I argue that there's actually some linguistic ambivalence built in here. And the colors here aren't any mistake, right? Uh, light green means go, dark red means stop. The beneficial aspects of assisted reproduction were framed according to the medical scientific view, and the prohibitions were framed morally. And this isn't to say by using the word ambivalence that the commissioners didn't know what they wanted or what they were talking about. This is an enormous field of public policy. So it makes sense that you're going to think, well, some of these things can be beneficial and some of these things can be harmful. But I think it is important to note that that linguistic ambivalence was built in. So here's the Scala view I mentioned before. And I'm using Scala as a bit of a lightning, lightning rod because her work is the best, but for a number of legal scholars, primarily legal scholars and political scientists who subscribe to this view of policy framing. And here's my slight change. I'm snow. Medical, scientific, moral, and we've got some ambivalence. So that's part of the story. The next part of the story has to do with jurisdictional framing. Because in my reading of the Royal Commission, they didn't just frame this issue in terms of policy substance, but they also framed it in terms of who ought to have the authority. Before going on to that, I'm going to say a brief word about Canadian federalism and healthcare. Uh, this will not be new information to anyone in this room who has taught or taken a class on Canadian constitutionalism. This is a simplification. I don't know if it constitutes a gross simplification. But it is a simplification, but one that I think is nevertheless largely true, that health care is largely provincial jurisdiction in Canada. Because of a number of provisions here in the Constitution, and because of jurisprudence from the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council, and then the Supreme Court of Canada after it, making health policy, making policy for the regulation of medicine, uh, is largely provincial jurisdiction. It is true that the federal government has some authority. There is something called Health Canada. There is something called the Canada Health Act. There is something called the Canada Health Transfer. Right? But mostly that authority comes with financial, uh, um, financial policy making and uh, in terms of giving money to the provinces and attaching conditions to that funding. But there are times in which the federal government can make health policy. And the constitutional mechanisms by which they can, the reasons in the Constitution the federal government can do that, there's two of them. The first is the Peace Order and Good Government Clause. So this is a, an original residual clause at the beginning of Section 91 of the Constitution. Most people are familiar, this is the Constitution Act 1867, with the phrase peace, order, and good government. It's come to be sort of a Canadian mantra that separates us from the, the United States. But in terms of constitutional law, the Judicial Committee and then the Supreme Court of Canada have whittled down POG to being useful to the federal government. That is to say, the federal government can say we can legislate in this otherwise provincial field based on peace, order, and government in one of two instances. The first uh, is in an instance of a national emergency, which by its definition is temporary and um, sweeping. The second has to do when there's an issue of national concern. This is an issue that goes beyond provincial boundaries, that cannot be contained 
by provincial governments and has inherent national dimensions, to use another word the Supreme Court uses in its jurisprudence. Now, even among those who were extremely critical of assisted reproductive technologies in the early 90s, no one was seriously arguing that they constituted a national emergency. So really, the only constitutional instrument available to uh, the Royal Commission from Peace Order and Good Government in making its framing recommendations was that national concern component of POG. But I said there were two instruments, and the other is the criminal law power. Now, the federal government in Canada has the authority to define the criminal law, to say what is and is not a crime, and it also has the authority to attach regulations to those criminal prohibitions to help uh, implement uh, and, and uh, better implement those criminal prohibitions. And those can obviously touch on fields of health care. Just think of how prohibitions on drugs uh, impact health care policy that would seek to use those drugs to help people uh, for various reasons. So there is some federal involvement. These are the two instruments that are available to the federal government if they're going to regulate in the field of health. With respect to assisted reproductive technologies, those criminal prohibitions were likely going to be valid. Now, they might not withstand charter scrutiny, but in terms of whether or not the federal government has the ability to act, if the federal government makes something a crime, attaches a criminal penalty, has a criminal law purpose, then likely it's going to be upheld as valid criminal law. It's been generally, um, uh, by the Supreme Court of Canada, interpreted as a quite broad power. But the regulatory authority attached to those criminal prohibitions was less clear. So the Royal Commission was operating in an area uh, which by no means had certainty over the federal government's ability to fully legislate according to its recommendations, and that's why it needed to frame the policy according to jurisdictional framing. So how did it do that? Normatively speaking, in terms of what the federal government should do, its argument was one based on national intervention, and I'd say better national importance, national uniformity as being a goal. The first chapter of the Royal Commission was titled, A Comprehensive Response to Issues of National Importance. That gives away the punchline of who they thought should be the main actor in this field. They saw a national strategy as the only feasible response. They saw assisted reproductive technologies as too serious to be delayed, fragmented, or tentative, and that is to say, policy made by provincial governments or medical organizations. And of course, this covered all the aspects for which they had recommended, the beneficial aspects of assisted reproduction, uh, and those things which ought to be criminally prohibited. So there's your normative frame. Procedurally, they relied most heavily on that national concern branch of peace, order, and good government. For those of you who are familiar with POG jurisprudence, a lot of these terms will be familiar to you. Genuine national concern, singleness, distinctiveness, and invisibility, interrelatedness, profound importance, maybe not profound importance so much, these terms are lifted right out of Supreme Court jurisprudence that had in the past been used to uphold or to explain why it is that peace, order, and good government, when it is that peace, order, and good government can apply. So the commission knew what it was doing, and it said these terms, this language applies to assisted reproductive technologies because of their unique nature. And uniqueness was another uh, term that was used quite frequently. They did recognize the commissioners and the commission that the criminal law power um, was available to Parliament, but they spoke about it very briefly and said, yeah, for the criminal prohibitions, obviously we've got the criminal law power. For everything else, we've got peace, order, and good government, because these are issues of inherent national concern. So, here's my updated policy framing diagram. We've got this medical moral ambivalence in terms of substantive framing. We've got Normative framing in terms of national uniformity and national importance. Why should the federal government act rather than other governments? And procedurally, primarily peace, order, and good government. And secondarily, the criminal law power. But mostly POG, mostly national concern. The criminal law power, of course, corresponds quite simply to those moral frames which were used for criminal prohibitions. POG and national uniformity in terms of being an apt procedural justification was less clear. Now, the grunt work of a lot of this, and the most boring stuff, which I'm not going to uh, talk about that much, of, of this research project, involved my examination of sort of all the federal policymaking process, starting with the Royal Commission, right up to the passage of legislation in 2004. This includes committee hearings and Hansard debates in Parliament for four attempted pieces of legislation. Only the fourth one ended up passing. Uh, a hugely influential Standing Committee on Health report that heard all sorts of committee hearings and then reported in 2001, Health Canada report, other stakeholder reports uh, that eventually resulted in the Assisted Human Reproduction Act. 
And one of my arguments is that these frames were, for the most part, maintained nearly identically throughout this entire 11 year process, even as assisted reproductive technologies developed and became normalized in society. Uh, and part of the reason for that is that the Royal Commission was operating in one of those information vacuums. Uh, and so there's a term in the economics and political science literature called path dependence, that when you sort of initiate policy in a vacuum, there's a stickiness to these ideas. And from the evidence I've seen, they certainly stuck through, um, through the policymaking process, which I'll, I'll get to more in a moment. But what is the Assisted Human Reproduction Act? What is this piece of legislation, now 11 years old, that was passed by the federal government? Well, at one time, it was called by Health Canada, one of the most comprehensive frameworks in the world for assisted reproductive technologies. I think in terms of on paper, that's largely true. That, that sort of, if implemented and if fully regulated, it may have been one of the most comprehensive frameworks in the world. It fit with that broad definition of assisted reproduction I gave at the beginning. Um, albeit not addressing parentage policy. But what's fascinating is in terms of its content, it largely followed the Royal Commission. It had criminal prohibitions, and criminal prohibitions on most of the things the Royal Commission recommended prohibiting. Payment for human reproductive material, payment for surrogacy, these are banned in Canada beyond expenses. Human cloning, animal-human chimeras, all sorts of genetic manipulation, criminally prohibited. You can go to jail for up to 10 years or pay a $500,000 fine if caught doing these activities. Controlled activities largely fit with what the Royal Commission had recommended for regulation. So these are activities that are prohibited unless done in accordance with regulations and a license. And most of these activities you'll see listed here relate to sort of the day-to-day -day work of governing fertility clinics, right? Rules for donor consent, patient consent, licensing, keeping of patient records, rules for clinical practice. And I should say as well, it was more a regulatory structure with the idea that Health Canada is going to create the regulations later, after the passage of legislation, which isn't uncommon federally. And third, it created this national agency, Assisted Human Reproduction Canada, sometimes known as the Assisted Human Reproduction Agency of Canada. Uh, so in terms of content, I've studied other royal commissions. There are all sorts of royal commissions that spend the same number of taxpayer dollars, same number of years, same number of recommendations, and just don't get implemented by governments. Uh, and so, at least on paper, this was a very successful Royal Con Commission in terms of being implemented uh, largely into legislation. Its frames were also recreated. So the medical scientific frame, here's a number of quotes from health ministers, different health ministers because it took 11 years, you had different health ministers. Alan Rock and Anne McClellan. Uh, did I read the other day that Anne McClellan is now Chancellor of Dalhousie University? So here's a couple quotes from her, I assume she's somewhere in the audience today, right? Um, um, Enormous potential and great hope that Canadians can benefit from the research associated with assisted reproduction. Speaks to one of the most fundamental desires, having a family. I mentioned that standing committee report. It was called building families, right? There's great merit in research in this field. So clearly, the federal government and parliamentarians viewed some aspects of assisted reproduction as being scientifically beneficial and as creating hope for people who previously could not have families to have families. So there's that medical frame. But when it came to the prohibited activities, prohibited technologies, same moral framing that we saw from the Royal Commission. Here are quotes from Alan Rock, Anne McClellan, and committee chairperson Bonnie Brown. Higher notion than science alone. This one, activities that Canadians simply will not countenance because of it, they offend shared values. That's very similar to the wording the Royal Commission used. And the intent is of the legislation, of the criminal prohibition specifically, is to eliminate commodification and eliminate commercialization. So again, this linguistic ambivalence is continued um, lockstep from the Royal Commission. In terms of its normative jurisdictional frame, we also see continuation of national uniformity, of national intervention, of national importance. Here's Alan Rock again, an area where federal leadership is needed, national issues that reflect national values. Uh, Pan-Canadian approach that doesn't follow the patchwork of the United States. Frequent reference made to the United States, as always occurs with healthcare and social policy in Canada, as a road that we don't want to go down. Information needs to be collected on a national basis, and the goal is summarized by one witness to develop uniform legislation across the country. And I think that's largely true, that that was the primary goal of this legislation. Procedurally, though, is where we see the shift. And this is where the, the, the story takes an important twist. Procedurally, the government started justifying it on behalf of the criminal law power. So here's a federal official 
uh, Department of Justice talking at committee that saying the basis on which we're proposing to, to legislate and regulate is the criminal law power. So beneficial and negative aspects. Here's Alan Rock, former lawyer, at the time Minister of Health, satisfied as a minister, as a person, and as a lawyer that it'll be upheld as criminal. And speaking to a former civil servant, he told me that the Department of Justice was not persuaded by the argument that it could be done under peace, order, and good government. So my question is, what changed? What happened between 1993 and early 2000s into 2004 that persuaded the government to shift away from the Royal Commission's procedural recommendation while maintaining its recommendations in terms of content and indeed its frames in terms of substance and uh, normative why the federal government ought to act? Two reasons. The first is that even in 1993, the POG argument wasn't particularly strong. So we've got eminent legal scholars, Pat Healy and Alison Harvison Young, both, both judges subsequently, uh, arguing in the 1990s that peace, order, and good government provided a weak basis for which there was little jurisprudential support. Yes, the Royal Commission lifted that language of singleness, indivisibility, and distinctiveness from uh, Supreme Court jurisprudence, but it didn't explain why the content of those cases say the environment as something that clearly goes beyond provincial boundaries or even fighting inflation, why that ought to apply to assisted reproductive technologies. Why they couldn't be contained by suitable provincial regulation, for example. Uh, and in fact, their only reference, reference the Royal Commission to a quote unquote clear precedent was radio broadcasting being governed by, um, by the federal government. So it was, relatively speaking, uh, a poor justification in 1993. In the Commission's defense, what it couldn't have known is the way that Supreme Court jurisprudence shifted during the exact time that federal parliamentarians were debating uh, using the Royal Commission's recommendations to debate and create assisted human reproduction legislation uh, from 1995 right up to the early 2000s. Let me explain. Four cases here, some of you may be familiar with. Each of these cases, they deal with tobacco, the environment, firearms, and marijuana. In each of these cases, contemporaneous to federal government debating assisted reproductive technology policy, we've got a federal law that has a criminal prohibition and impugns, at least in theory, on an aspect of provincial legislation. In most cases, but not all cases, health. So we've got a federal law banning tobacco, federal law banning, um, uh, I believe it was the dumping of pesticides, I could be wrong, but it was the Canadian Environmental Protection Act, federal law with the, the firearms registry, federal law banning marijuana. In each case, there are regulations attached to that criminal prohibition. And in each case, the Supreme Court of Canada, sometimes divided, upholds the federal legislation. So this is a winning streak for the federal government. But it's a winning streak uh, with, a, with a less broad tool. Um, can't think of a good analogy. Um, but it's a win it, it, peace order and good government is broader than the criminal law power. And, uh, the, the criminal law power in each of these instances is the mechanism that the Supreme Court uses to uphold the legislation. And we see this language, don't find it necessary, not necessary, unnecessary, leave this question for another day, as to whether or not if the criminal law power had failed, that this legislation, even in an area like the environment that clearly has a sort of national dimension to it that goes beyond provincial boundaries, yeah. the Supreme Court said, we're not going to answer that peace order and good government question. And Supreme Court does not always not answer questions that it doesn't need to. There are many instances where Supreme Court and other courts say, we don't need to answer this question, but we will anyway, uh, just, just, just for future reference, for clarity in the future. But in each of these cases, the Supreme Court moves away from peace, order, and good government. So there's very good reasons why the federal government would say, that peace, order, and good government recommendation, national concern, wasn't very good in 1993, even worse now. We're doing this all under the criminal law. And it's worth noting that expert opinion agreed with the federal government. Here are a sampling of some quotes at committee in Parliament talking about the legislation. Pat Healy, later a judge. Tim Caulfield, law professor at the University of Alberta. Brent Wintwick on behalf of the Canadian Bar Association. And these are just a sampling of different law professors and legal experts saying, yes, the federal government has the authority to legislate and regulate and license under the criminal law authority. Confident that it will be upheld, allay any concerns about constitutional justification 
of all the legal witnesses who came in to speak on the constitutionality of the law, and there were over a dozen, only one suggested that the law might get struck down for federalism reasons. Right? So this is a, a lesson to not trust the experts um, on, uh, on anything, but especially constitutional law. That includes me. Um, here's the table, the Royal Commission's policy framing from before. Here's the change in the Assisted Human Reproduction Act. Everything stays the same, including the normative frame. That's crucial. But criminal law becomes the sole justification. Right? And now, this was going to be a problem. Because Quebec, the government of Quebec, was always opposed to the non-criminal aspects of the Assisted Human Reproduction Act. Quebec's view was essentially, you know what, ban all you want. You want to criminalize something, go ahead and do it. That's your prerogative. You start regulating medicine. You start regulating health care, then you're impugning on provincial jurisdiction. And liberal and PQ governments alike in Quebec wrote letters to the federal government saying, if you regulate in this area, we're going to challenge you in court. And Bloc Québécois members, and indeed a couple Canadian Alliance members as well, frequently made statements saying, this is going to violate the Constitution over health care. And in 2007, Quebec, true to its word, launches a reference case in its Court of Appeal which asks essentially, this is again a simplification of the question, I don't think the entire question would fit on the whole page, uh, are the non-criminal aspects of the Assisted Human Reproduction Act ultra vires, that is to say, outside the legal authority of the Parliament of Canada? Non-criminal aspects, again, remember, ban all you want. And they won, three to zero, unanimously in the Court of Appeal in 2008, but it was quickly appealed and everyone knew that this was going to go to the Supreme Court of Canada. So in 2010, the Supreme Court finally rules, after 18 months, I believe, of, uh, between hearing and, and, uh, uh, and the actual case, which I think is around three times the average limit, so it was heavily divided court. And again, the question is, do the non-criminal sections of the Assistant Human Reproduction Act, this is my paraphrasing of the question, violate provincial jurisdiction over health care? Small asterisks there because there were certain minor prohibitions that Quebec said, that's not actually a prohibition, that's really regulation. But essentially, it was all the criminal stuff Quebec left alone, and it said everything else, licensing, privacy information, everything mostly that goes on at the fertility clinics, um, enforcement of what goes on at the fertility clinics, that's all traditionally provincial health care jurisdiction. Federal government, you can't do that. And the Supreme Court rules December 23rd, 2010, and they split 5-4 in favor of the provinces. Quebec wins. It's actually a 4-4 one decision. I'll go through each. Um, in, in total. Yes, it's a reference opinion. Yes, it's not legally binding, but as anyone here who studies reference opinions knows, governments treat them as legally binding, and this government did as well. And this is a 163-page decision. Um, many doctrinal disagreements. In the modern era, in the McLaughlin court, I would go as far as saying this is one of the sharpest and some of the attacks the most personal between the groups of justices uh, in terms of disagreement. At one point, one group said to another group that their approach was contrary to the normal form of constitutional analysis. Um, fundamentally, though, the disagreement between the two groups, having read the decision about a million times, comes down to whether or not the purpose of the impugned provisions is the non-criminal aspects of the legislation are designed to regulate a good, to promote good things, or to eliminate evil, to stop harms. Chief Justice McLaughlin, for herself and three other justices, she wrote the opinion. She said that the impugned provisions, remember this is not the criminal aspects, this is everything else, target evils. And I'm not being hyperbolic and nor is she, this is common Supreme Court uh, language uh, when determining what the limits of the criminal law power. She said the purpose of those regulations, of that regulatory, of that administrative authority is to prohibit practices that would undercut moral values, produce public health evils and threaten security. And that the regulations, this is crucial, were ancillary or necessarily necessary to the achievement of the criminal prohibitions. And so the act as a whole, according to these four justices, was valid criminal law jurisdiction. They agreed with the legal experts uh, who said that the, the whole act will be upheld so long as you've got some criminal prohibitions in there. Justices LaBelle and Deschamps, for their part, interestingly, two Quebec justices, said that the impugned provisions target goods. They recognized that the prohibitions targeted evils. Remember, the prohibitions mostly weren't challenged. But that those prohibitions didn't depend on the existence of the regulatory scheme. In fact, they were able to stand alone. 
regardless of whether or not the regulations existed. And they pointed to the fact that at the time, only one regulation had actually been passed by Health Canada, and yet the criminal prohibitions remained very much in place. And so the way I've characterized this is as saying that LaBelle and Deschamps said that the provinces and the federal government have a division of labor uh, with respect to assisted reproductive technologies, where the federal government can ban all the bad stuff, but once you get to promoting and regulating the good stuff, medicine, healthcare, that's provincial health care jurisdiction. So we've got a 4-4 standoff. And at the time, the most rookie justice on the court, Justice Cromwell from Nova Scotia, who I believe is now the third longest standing justice on the court, which shows, shows how much turnover there's been in the last four and a half years, uh, he made a slight alteration, one I happen to actually agree with, which said that actually those prohibitions that Quebec says aren't prohibitions, they are prohibitions. Um, but everything else, virtually everything else, he agreed with LaBelle and Deschamps. And in fact, at one point, very brief opinion, something like 10 paragraphs, he says, I agree substantially for the reasons uh, offered by LaBelle and Deschamps. So essentially, he says, all the criminal prohibitions, constitutional, virtually everything else, unconstitutional. I said that the major disagreement here was about legislative history. And it was. Or sorry, that it was about whether or not it was a good or an evil, the impugned provisions. Why did the justices, the two groups of justices, come to such divergent opinions on this? My view is it's because of how they read and the weight they gave to legislative and royal commission history. And Chief Justice McLaughlin, and here I'm showing my hand and telling you who I feel was in the right in this decision, largely ignored that legislative history. She said the royal commission was merely policy analysis, which it of course wasn't. The benefits were not the focus of Parliament's efforts that the dominant thrust of the act was prohibitory, and the act was essentially a series of prohibitions. This is not grounded in the legislative history from my reading of committee hearings, ministerial statements, and I'll point you again to this slide from earlier from Ministers of Health, talking about the enormous potential, the great benefits, the great merit in research, the fact that the standing committee report on the legislation was called building families. That's not language used to justify an act that's dominant thrust is prohibitory. By contrast, Justices LaBelle and Deschamps, were, their opinion was heavily informed by legislative history. They made frequent reference to the Royal Commission and frequent reference to ministerial statements talking about how important the Royal Commission was to the development of legislation. And they quoted uh, these ministerial and public and um, uh, uh, sort of deputy ministerial civil, civil servant statements. Uh, and they found that the unifying purpose of the legislation was not the promotion of good things, nor the elimination of evils, but the true purpose of the leg legislation was national intervention, national importance, national uniformity, to have the same system in place across the country for assisted reproductive technologies. And in my reading, that's largely true. And that's a good thing for many people. I'll bet most people in this room would agree, yeah, having national uniformity in this sort of field would be a good thing, or many people in this room, if not most. But the problem, and this is perhaps the most important quotation from the decision, is that LaBelle and Deschamps said, neither a desire for uniformity nor the very novelty of a medical technology can serve as the basis for an exercise of the federal criminal law power. Importance and a desire for uniformity, that sounds like peace order and good government language, but that's not why the criminal law power exists, to have this important issue be the same across the country. We're a constitutional federation, we have a division of powers in the Constitution, and the governments must adhere to the rules of the game, and of course the way that the courts have interpreted the rules of the game. According to my language, you can have a normative frame about why you ought to intervene all you want, but it requires that um, coherent procedural justification. The irony, and this is an overused term, but I think I'm using it correctly here, the irony of all this is that the most faithful reading of legislative history, which came from these justices, used that legislative history to actually strike most of this legislation down. Again, I know reference opinion, not technically struck down, essentially struck down. So here's the way the Assisted Human Reproduction Act was framed. Here's what Chief Justice McLaughlin needed to do in order to make the frames align. She needed to say, no, 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 really, the legislation was all about moral outrage. It was, its dominant thrust was prohibitory. It was designed to eliminate a number of activities. Whereas LaBelle and Deschamps, more informed by um, legislative history, said no, the act is actually about national uniformity, uh, national consistency, and the criminal law power beyond the prohibitions can't apply 
to regulations designed to promote beneficial behavior. The result of the reference opinion, Quebec wins, of course. And so all of this stuff that belongs relative, mostly speaking, to fertility clinics, the before, during, and after of people going to fertility clinics becomes, or some would say remains, because the federal government never actually regulated in this field, they just said they would, remains provincial jurisdiction. And for those desiring, whether it be national regulation or provincial regulation, just some regulation beyond criminal law of assisted reproductive technologies, this is not a happy ending. Because Quebec passed a law in 2004, they've passed an updated, or they, sorry, they've drafted an updated law in late 2000, sorry, Quebec passed the law in 2010. They've drafted an updated law, which will likely pass uh, in the fall of 2014, just a few months ago. But outside of Quebec, the provinces have done virtually nothing in the four plus years in this field. So this is why I say policy failure. The Royal Commission and the federal government in the 1990s, and indeed the federal opposition parties, thought something ought to be done. And beyond criminal prohibitions and beyond the province of Quebec, little has been done by governments. And that's why this is a policy failure. A slight addendum that, that I think tells an interesting story going forward for the development of federalism jurisprudence and how federal governments ought to react and anticipate different Supreme Court rulings is when the federal government finally amended the Assistant Human Reproduction Act in its 2012 omnibus budget legislation. So you can be forgiven for not remembering this um, because sort of they packed this in. I think it was section 700 and something of the omnibus budget legislation. Um, but what the federal government did when it amended the Assisted Human Reproduction Act, it largely implemented the Supreme Court's ruling, according to its own interpretation, closed down that national agency, subsumed its remaining functions, which are very little, into Health Canada, removed the controlled activities, that's all those sort of regulated activities, and all the licensing requirements. And most interestingly, it replaced Section 10, which had been struck down, it was a controlled activity, on the use of human reproductive material. So this was, you can't use sperm, eggs, and embryos unless done in accordance with regulation and license. Regulations and licenses hadn't been created yet. And they put in a new, much more detailed Section 10, which is also a qualified prohibition, right? So the federal government says, oh, all we can do is ban stuff now, we've just got to prohibit. We can't attach regulations. That was one approach. But they didn't do that. They actually introduced another qualified prohibition. In effect, what was another controlled activity, even though they took that word out. But they did something I've never seen before. There are a lot of legal experts in the room before, or the room right now, and you can tell me if you've seen this before. In any event, if it does happen, it's quite rare. I'm familiar with legislative preambles. I'm familiar with statutory de declarations at the beginning of legis legislation. I've never seen a government introduce a subsection at the beginning of one section and say the purpose of this section is to reduce the risk to human health and safety, including the risk and the transmission of disease. This is a direct response to the Supreme Court of Canada, which says if you want to attach a regulation to a criminal prohibition, you've got to show us the evil that you're eliminating, and you've got to show us how you're going to eliminate it. And the federal government says, okay, here it is. And sort of you think, oh, this is the federal government really pushing back. They really want to regulate this area. But this section is not yet in force because the regulations haven't been created yet. I could do another 45 minutes on why the regulations haven't been created yet. Um, but suffice it to say, that's the federal government showing that if you do the same thing, but you frame it in a different way, they think at least that you're going to have a higher likelihood of success. So what are some of the implications of this ruling for Canadian law and politics? On the judicial side, this is a majority ruling. Yes, it's 441. Yes, it's tentative. Yes, there have been subsequent federalism cases, but none that have dealt with sort of this type of jurisprudence, really. Um, legislative history becomes more important. Legislative history has become increasingly important in charter decisions, uh, but the majority went back and they looked at what happened in Parliament and they said, no, this doesn't matter what the Attorney General is saying now. Look at what the government said. This is the purposes of the legislation. On Parliament's side, there is an incentive, as they did with their amendment to the Assisted Human Reproduction Act, to emphasize the evils, right? To introduce the Supreme Court, I didn't talk about this, but the majority introduced this concept from charter analysis of a reasoned apprehension of harm, which is to say, show us the harm you're trying to eliminate and show us directly how you're going to do it. You just can't say, We're, this all has to do with criminal prohibitions because there's six criminal prohibitions in there, right? And so we see there is an incentive to emphasize evils. And I would even go so far as to say, had Parliament passed the exact same legislation that it did, but all of the government statements had been saying, the dominant thrust of this act is prohibitory. It's all about 
eliminating harmful things, there's nothing beneficial here of assisted reproductive technologies, that that same legislation would have had a much higher likelihood of being upheld in court. Counterfactual, but that's kind of what we do. Uh, and finally, the further marginalization of peace, order, and good government. The Royal Commission's dominant legislative or constitutional instrument in 1993, the, the, the federal government doesn't even bother using it as a secondary argument in the 2008 or 2010 cases in Quebec and at the Supreme Court of Canada. And the Quebec Court of Appeal, I should note, said even if you'd use peace, order, and good government, you couldn't use it anyway. It wouldn't, it wouldn't work. If POG's National Concern Clause is not dead, it is hanging on for dear life. And if the federal government wants to legislate in terms of national concern, this must now reflect national condemnation. It can't be national concern about something beneficial. It has to be condemning an evil activity uh, in order for the federal government to legislate, at least in terms of healthcare policy. So that's how we got to our blocked road. Um, what are some of the current institutional roadblocks? First of all, we have a completely uninterested national government. Um, and I would say an uninterested national opposition as well. The only time that the ND, so the Liberals have said virtually nothing about assisted reproduction. The federal government amended the decision, but they never talked about it. I don't think any health minister has ever uttered the words national reproduction. And the only time that the NDP has got up in arms about national re reproduction is about the lack of regulations and really about financial mismanagement at the former agency assisted human reproduction Canada. This is not going to be an election issue in the, in the election this year. Uh, no political party wants to touch this for a variety of different reasons, some of which are quite obvious why certain parties wouldn't want to be seen as legislating reproduction assisted or otherwise, right? So we have political parties that are, um, for a variety of reasons, loath to touch this issue. Health Canada, yes, the federal government has control over Health Canada, um, but oftentimes it develops its regulations somewhat independent, less so with this government, of government um, recommendations, and it is completely uninterested in developing the regulations for the few remaining categories for assisted reproduction over which it has authority. And in spite of repeated calls and requests for why aren't you regulating, why aren't you regulating, why aren't you regulating, Health Canada is just saying, we've got it up on our website, it's fine. Uh, and so they're, they're, they have limited regulatory authority and they're not exercising that authority anyway. Maybe that will change with the change of government. Who knows? We have uninterested provincial governments outside of Quebec. Um, I didn't talk about the Quebec legislation, happy to in the Q&A. Outside of Quebec, no government wants to touch this. And Quebec legislated in 2010, it brought in funding for IVF and it introduced regulations for embryo transfer. It has now introduced legislation pulling back that funding for IVF and it is getting absolutely slammed by medical organizations. No provincial government is going to look at Quebec and say, yeah, legislating for assisted human reproduction, this is a political winner. We should put this at the top of our election platform in the next election, right? Years ago I wrote, um, because I study Australia as well and I'd spent some time down there, looking at how state governments in Australia have collaborated around assisted reproduction in order to create somewhat uniform, imperfect, but somewhat uniform public policy. And I argued that Canada ought, can do the same and ought to do the same through various existing institutions. I'm far less optimistic. Um, having looked at it a little more closely, Canadian provincial governments don't have a history of intergovernmental collaboration in these sorts of ways, in these sorts of fields. We have a lot more financial intergovernmental collaboration. This is collaboration between provincial governments. We certainly don't have federal leadership the way they do in Australia to get the provinces together to regulate. Uh, so I think that that is another institutional roadblock. And we have medical organizations that are very powerful, national specialist organizations and provincial colleges of physicians and surgeons. And anytime you do anything that could be seen as potentially uh, introducing a penalty, as influencing clinical practice, um, they, as we've seen in Quebec, are going to jump out and say this is an affront to Canadian healthcare, this is an affront to doctor-patient confidentiality. And so long as their self-regulation remains competent, I'm not saying that self-regulation on assisted reproductive technologies is perfect. My supervisor would kill me if I said that. Um, but it, so long as it's competent and we're not getting an octomom situation every day and we're not getting crazy stories of cowboy doctors transferring 13 embryos at a time and hyperstimulating every woman who comes in, then provincial governments are going to say, you know what, they're doing fine, we're not going to touch this. So 
For those of us in this room who think there ought to be some government regulation, as a political scientist who studies institutions and thinks institutions matter, I show you a number of roadblocks why I think that is not going to be the case and is going to be a very, very long time outside of Quebec before we see any regulation in this particular field. And so the hope must rest that the medical organizations continue to update their policy, continue to make uh, good public policy because they're the only ones who are actually de facto creating regulations beyond the federal prohibitions in this field. And with that, thank you for listening and I invite your questions. <laughs> Put a hand here. With this all in mind, what is the chances that, that we're going to have unregulated euthanasia in Canada? in February <coughs> 2016. 2016, because that's the year on from when the decision happens, right? Um, I, my hunch is, and this is a, a, certainly not as familiar with the field of, I've, I read the decision, um, but with, with medical, my hunch is that provincial medical organizations are going to collaborate uh, with provincial governments in this time in order to um, uh, sort of create a policy framework within those provinces. I think it's already happening in Quebec, if I'm not mistaken, and maybe British Columbia. Um, but so I think that this, this is an issue that's more touchable. You know, poll after poll shows Canadians are in favor, especially those who've experienced it, uh, are, are in favor of some form of physician-assisted uh, dying. And uh, in terms of the federal level, I don't think this government is going to legislate, but in October, this government may not be the government anymore. Um, and I believe, I just heard this clip on the news the other day, so I don't know if it's true, but last week I heard that the Liberals were planning on introducing a motion into Parliament. I don't, did they actually do that? Um, it shows at least that the opposition parties are not saying, as they have with assisted reproduction, okay, none of us want to touch this hot potato. The opposition parties are saying, we're willing to take this issue, and we're willing to do some sort of federal, to amend the, 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 the criminal code as it exists. Uh, I'm unclear, unclear about what the federal government will do. But I think we'll, by, by February of 2016, we'll see far more provincial policy making in concert with medical organizations on assisted dying than we will see on assisted human reproduction. That would be my prediction. Sandra. So in the absence of the octomoms and the hyperstimulation, <laughs> what is the need for regulation? That is what many would, would say. Um, here's an example of why perhaps regulation is a good thing. Uh, Medical organizations across the country, particularly the Society of Obstetricians and Gynecologists of Canada and the Canadian Fertility uh, and Andrology Society, those are the sort of um, the organizations, the fertility and, and obstetrical organizations that come together, create policy documents and say, this is best clinical practice in the country. And they're largely followed in clinics. I have a colleague who can tell you more about the few cowboy clinics who sort of don't always follow the rules. But generally speaking, because the community is so small, they tend to be followed. Um, and they've recommended uh, implementing single embryo transfer uh, for women under the age of 35 who are healthy and double, em or, uh, yeah, double embryo transfer for older women for certain conditions. Those recommendations have been happening and embryo transfer rates and twin rates have been falling across the country. Quebec introduces its regulations in 2010 and Quebec's twin rates plummet. So there's something about being forced to do it by government that has made Quebec physicians more likely to do it. Now an asterisk there is that Quebec government said, okay, you've got to decrease your twin rates, you've got to decrease your embryo transfer rates, and they were stricter than the federal guidelines for other provinces, but they also said at the same time, oh, we're going to fund IVF, which means way more work for all of you. Uh, and so now, I, I've said for years, and, uh, and, and I'm not the only one to say this, that those two things are independent of one another. Whether you fund IVF or whether you implement rules for embryo transfer, you can do one or both or neither. And now that the Quebec government is saying we're keeping those rules for embryo transfer and we're defunding IVF, the Quebec physician organizations are, and somewhat getting away with, saying the funding of IVF has been responsible for this drop in twin rates. I can't believe you're taking away this funding of IVF. Um, so it'll be interesting to see if, if this law passes in Quebec and IVF is defunded and those embryo transfer um, regulations remain in place, if Quebec rates go back up, I highly doubt it. So that's just an instance of... So wait a minute. If that's happened because the patient doesn't... If, if I don't have to pay for IVF, mm -hmm. then I'm happy with single embryo transfer. I think if you have to pay... For, I mean, I'm, I have not been a patient at IVF, um, but I think if you have to pay for IVF, even if you don't have to pay for it, and I've, I've witnessed this in, 
infertility clinics when I've um, sat in, um, patients ask, can you transfer more? Even more than the, the two that's permitted. Uh, and well, I mean, this is when they're paying for it, yes. But uh, patients want to increase their chance of pregnancy. And if you say, ah, you know, you, you, you might be more likely to have twins. There's these medical complications. Will my pregnancy rate go up? Yes, it will go up a little bit. Patients will say that they want it more. That's my hunch. Each person who has an opinion about elements of IVF has a strong opinion. But for each element, you use, there are usually large variations in opinion. Mm -hmm. And a substantial, at least a substantial minority, who believe one way or another. How is it that the <coughs> Royal Commission said that there were shared values when, in fact, the controversy suggests? It may not be shared values. In fact, the commission leadership itself suggests that there are no shared values. For the first time in any royal commission history, uh, there were a few commissioners, three or four, who were far more partial to that moral view of assisted reproductive technologies, to recommend more criminalization and to say that th these are problematic. And they had such disagreement uh, with the chairperson and with the chairperson's staff that the, the royal commission, the royal commissioner, Patricia Baird, asked the Prime Minister for permission, got the, prime, got the permission, and fired four of the commissioners on the royal permission. It might have been three of the commissioners um, who didn't disagree with her, or who disagreed with her, and replaced them. So there's a lot of evidence that the royal commission sought to um, eliminate dissent. Uh, and this is certainly not the first instance in Canada or elsewhere of a government ascribing a national consensus or national values to anything. I've done some work. Politicians frequently say there is a national consensus against commercialization. In Canada, we don't pay for things. We don't pay for organs. We don't pay for sex. We don't pay for uh, human reproductive material. It's just something we don't do. There's, this doesn't exactly correspond with, with polling data, but it's, an, it's a nice rhetorical strategy, especially when you compare us to the United States. And so um, I think it was a successful rhetorical strategy on the part of the commissioners and uh, the federal government to say that, that we've talked to Canadians and we've got a national consensus against these sorts of behaviors. Having said that, I mean, there were some things. There was a, certainly a national consensus against human cloning um, and a number of other sort of extreme, more extreme genetic, genetic manipulation uh, factors. And I should add as well that one commissioner wrote a dissenting report um, on some aspects. Suzanne Scorsoni, I think was her name, uh, and she just recommended that certain things be uh, a little more criminalized and a little more tightly regulated. So it's hardly surprising that the provincial, that the various political parties seem uninterested. Yeah, I think, well, in, in terms of that, I think there's a literature on what are known as sort of moral policies or morality policies, uh, which just in the Canadian context, especially political parties, you just don't win by legislating for them. Interestingly enough, assisted dying fits into this category and sort of this, this willingness of provinces to make legislation sort of goes against the norm. Um, but assisted reproduction certainly fits into that category, especially in Canada, where we have such a strong Supreme Court and so many of these issues end up making their way to the courts anyway. Uh, and the, you know, the Supreme Court is a supremely popular institution in Canada and its opinions have weight. So when courts do rule, federal governments don't want to do anything, frequently, not always, that are seen as pushing back against that Supreme Court decision, especially in such morally contentious areas. And this is, a, this is a particular government that not just assisted reproduction, but reproduction more generally. I uh, remember sort of stifling debate within the Conservative Party itself on this sort of fetal personhood. Um, uh, it wasn't even a, a bill. It was a, a sort of, what's that word, resolution. Um, for very good reason, the Conservatives have a history, especially as the Alliance Party in the early years as the Conservative Party, of having MPs speak up and say things that do not correspond with the views of the majority of Canadians on women's reproduction. So if I were Stephen Harper, I would not want to touch this with a 10-foot pole either, especially in election year. Yeah. Um, so just <coughs> reflecting on your um, study of federalism generally in this area of social policy and, and others as well, what do you think about the, uh, the kind of trend toward eroding the cog basis of justification and pushing toward the criminal law power in terms of federal powers? Is this, is this a good thing? Is it, is this a, you know, what are the strengths and 
I mean, I think it depends on one's view of federalism and of the role of the provinces. If you favor a strong federal government, um, then you're going to think that this is unfortunate. Uh, if you think that provincial variation, the thing about provincial variation is it's, it's at the moment, it's, it's, never, it's never optimal. It's when you look back and you say, oh yeah, um, Alberta had this really successful policy regarding X, or Ontario had this really successful policy regarding Y, that the other provinces subsequently adopted, um, that it, it looks better in retrospect. So I think that, I mean, I think healthcare innovation is going to be extremely important in the coming decades. And so in that sense, if we've got variation, then, uh, then that can be a good thing. And I'll point to assisted reproduction in Quebec. I am not in favor of funding in vitro fertilization from the federal government. I think there are more valuable Healthcare resources are scarce, and there are more valuable things. Any aspect in the healthcare system, I, I, I understand that those suffering with IVF disagree with me very strongly, um, but I think healthcare dollars are better spent elsewhere. And I think the Quebec experiment has shown other provinces that costs can balloon, that people who don't necessarily need IVF will nonetheless use it, uh, and, that, uh, and that this is a policy that perhaps ought not to be adopted. So this is an example where provincial experimentation has perhaps shown other provinces that this is not a particularly good policy. Well, I have one quick follow-up. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, there's something about the combination between the, the, what seems to me a kind of manipulability of the discourse as between promoting good mm -hmm. and preventing evil. So that, on the one hand, and then also something about the the kind of what looks to me like a sort of reification of legislative intent that that's happening in the, the analysis of, uh, of jurisdiction that makes me uneasy. Yeah. And so, can you comment a little bit on that? Yeah, I, I will submit that the the good bad dichotomy is a bit of a false one. Um, that certainly, you know, in order to promote something that's good, you are sometimes simultaneously eliminating something that that's bad. Um, I think in this particular instance, the McLaughlin argument, which was the Attorney General of Canada's argument that she accepted, uh, was particularly weak to say that this huge piece of legislation was essentially a vast array of prohibitions, which it wasn't. It was four or five prohibitions uh, and, then a, and then a huge regulatory structure. Um, I, I, in terms of legislative intent, I mean, especially when it's so recent, um, when the, the case is in 2010, and these statements were made in 2001, uh, I think it certainly at least deserves some weight. Uh, and in, we've all seen newspaper columns and, uh, on, on this most recent assisted dying decision and others saying, oh, basically the Supreme Court decide laws according to whatever they want to. I don't believe that. I think doctrine is constraining, uh, jurisprudence is constraining. I think legislative intent matters. But I think to the extent that we ignore legislative intent, um, then we move farther down that road of the Supreme Court just being able to pick whatever they want. Having said that, so I picked out the quotes that made my argument the strongest today, <laughs> and both sets of Supreme Court justices did the exact same thing and picked out the quotes. Uh, so it is, it is difficult, uh, just as in response to your question, of asserting, okay, these are the values of Canadians. It's also difficult to say this is the intent of the government over an 11-year period where they had several different uh, health ministers, where they had different leaders. Paul Martin was in power by the time they passed the legislation. Um, so I do, I do take that point, but I think uh, I would worry about throwing the baby out with the bathwater. So I, in that sense, I, uh, I think it's nice to at least have legislative intent be part of the conversation. Remember the BC Motor Vehicles case? Um, this is one of my favorites, where Justice Lemaire, a few years after the charters passed, was talking about um, what it is that this deputy minister had said, this is what we mean by this section of the charter. This is what we mean by this interpretation of fundamental justice. And Justice Lemaire said, oh, that statement should be given minimal weight. And thinking, this is a key framer of the charter saying, this is exactly what we mean, and it's like four years ago. Um, that's the sort of thing that I would hope to avoid. So I think it's worth having at least a bit of weight. Today, before I do, I just want to make an announcement about the next um, session that we have coming up. So Fiona Martin from the Department of Sociology and Social Anthropology here at Dow will be giving a talk on Friday, March 13th, uh, and it's entitled On Becoming a Mother and Disengaging from Injection Drug Use. So uh, let me just thank Dave then for his vigorous and uh, rigorous talk that uh, not only gave 
uh, me, and I think you as well, uh, a lot of rich insights into assisted human reproduction uh, technology policy, uh, but also goes a pretty long way toward making um, federalism sexy. <laughs> 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 Thanks, Jane. Thank you.